way back in 1976, Carol Cardinal Wojtyla, the future St. John Paul II, visited Philadelphia. Interesting, huh? We got another pope about to visit Philadelphia coming up this year. Now, back then, St. John Paul II, one of the most Marian popes in the history of the church, said this. We are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has ever experienced. I do not think American society or the Christian community realize this fully. I do, we are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the Antichrist. This confrontation lies within the plans of divine providence. It is therefore in God's plan, and it must be a trial which the church must take up and face courageously. 39 years later, we find ourselves in the midst of a culture that acts as if God is dead, where the allurement of temptation and sin and the atrocities of abortion and euthanasia, the plagues of pornography and human trafficking, and the redefinition of marriage are slowly killing the life of God within us. Before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. Jesus says that people will literally be scared to death in anticipation of what is coming upon the world, something so dreadful that even the powers of heaven will be shaken. The persecution to come will be the form of religious deception, offering humanity an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah, who was the word that became flesh. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this is not a time for cowards. This is not a time for wimps. Our Blessed Mother assures us that if we dedicate ourselves to prayer and make a serious effort to live the truth of our faith, and let me explain something to you people of God, truth. <laughs> truth is not an idea. Truth is not a concept that you form in your mind. Truth is a person, the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Truth is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he guarantees us if you live in his truth, his truth will do what? Set you free. Free to do what? To be the person who God created you to be, made in his image and likeness. Our blessed mother always leads us to Jesus, who strengthened us with his body and blood in the Holy Eucharist so that we can overcome the weakness to sin and break the hold that Satan has on us. Let us heed the words of her son, Jesus Christ, by being vigilant at all times and pray that we have the strength to escape the tribulations that are imminent. We can only be prepared if we are willing to turn away from the darkness and step into his wonderful light. At Fatima, Our Lady appeared to the seers, and she showed them a vision of hell. Lucia writes, Our Lady showed us a great sea of fire, which seemed to be under the earth. Plunged in this fire were demons and souls in human form, like transparent burning embers, all blackened, or burnished bronze, floating about in conflagration, now raised into the air by the flames that issued from within themselves together with great clouds of smoke. 
now falling back on every side like sparks in a huge fire without weight or equilibrium and amid shrieks and groans of pain and despair which horrified us and made us tremble with fear. Now, our young people are seeking this truth. But because they don't know who Jesus is, and how do we know that? Ask any young adult who's not in the church today. When they tell you, why aren't you going to mass? Mass is boring. Or I don't see a connection between my faith and what, and my, my faith, what happens at mass, and my life every day. For them, why? Because they don't know Jesus. They said, well, we can worship God any way that we want. And they don't understand. And what are, so what are our young people here today? Ouija boards. And this Charlie, Charlie thing. Look, look here's why I explain to young people, because they don't understand. They think this is a joke. They think this is a game. But Satan is trying to kill them. Satan is trying to destroy them. And they think that these Ouija boards, because of the movies coming out, they think Charlie, Charlie, you think all oh, this is a game? Look, look. Some of you are old enough to remember vampires, right? Back in the back when the vampires were really cool, not the ones today that can walk out into the light and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> now, if a vampire walked up to your house and you opened the door, there's Dracula, and you turned around and walked away, could Dracula come in your house? No. He can only come into your house if you invite him in. That is exactly what's going on with these Ouija boards and this Charlie Charlie. These young people are inviting Satan, are inviting demons, are inviting the forces of evil to come into their life, to come into their hearts. And they think it's a game, and it's not. This stuff is real. They need witnesses and examples of the truth. So many people say, oh, I wish to lead them to Jesus Christ. Oh, I wish my children be led to be Jesus. Who's supposed to lead them? We are. Jesus died and left a church. Now, as Sister Ann said yesterday, we need disciples. The greatest disciple in the history of the church was the Blessed Virgin Mary. Because what is a disciple? Someone who hears, accepts, and puts into practice in their life every day the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ and his holy Catholic Church. The greatest disciple, the greatest disciple was also the greatest saint in the history of the church. Now think about this for a second. The greatest saint in our church ain't a pope, ain't a bishop, ain't a priest, ain't even a man. The greatest example of what it means to be truly human, to listen to the voice of God and allow his voice to change your life is a wife and a mother. Two things, two things that are shunned by our culture. We are in a war against a culture that's trying to destroy our faith by eradicating religious freedom, ignoring completely the natural moral law, and demolishing the sacred institution of marriage by attempting to redefine it. Our Blessed Mother revealed to Lucia that this way of thinking and acting and being has eternal consequences. So many people think, all I have to do is be a good person. I was preaching a parish mission earlier this year, and I was greeting people after Mass, and a woman comes up with her beautiful children, says, hey, hi, guys, how is everybody, hey? And I asked, because she had a wedding ring on, so I asked, hey, where's your husband today? And, and I'm thinking, I was thinking, he's in the bathroom, he's bringing the car around. And she said, well, Deacon, he's not here. So, get the benefit of that, I thought, well, maybe he's a fireman. He's on days on at the station. <clears throat> maybe he's a physician. He's on rounds at the hospital. But she said, well, 
you, you got to understand, my husband, he's a good person. If you met him, oh, Deacon, you'd really like him. He's so kind and generous. He's such a wonderful provider for our family. He'd give you the shirt off his back. But he just doesn't see the need to go to Mass every Sunday because he says he can worship God any way that he wants. So I said, oh, I see. Well, when you get home, tell your husband something from Deacon Harold. <clears throat> tell him that I said there are no good people in heaven. The only people in heaven are who? Saints. And we are all called to be saints. We are all called to be perfect as the heavenly father is perfect. Being good is not good enough. Think about the rich young man. What must I do to have eternal life? Jesus said, you must keep the commandments. He said, I've done that since my youth. Did Jesus say, oh, well, you're good? No problem. You're fine. No, he did not. Jesus said, I, I, I know you've done all that, wonderful, but there's one more thing you have to do. Sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and come follow me. In other words, everything you think is important, everything that you're holding on to, everything that you think is important in this life, give it to me. Trust me. Let go and let God. And he couldn't do it. And he couldn't do it. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we got too many Catholics walking around there that, all, that think that all they have to do is be good people and they'll get to heaven, and they won't. They won't. It is up to the true disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary to show them the light of truth. Now, how is Satan going about with this deception that the Holy Father talked about? What does that look like today? <clears throat> we have to go back to Genesis. Now, everything was great until we got to Genesis 3 and the snake shows up. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting. Of all the things that God created, not who, but what, does Satan go after first? The family. Not the trees, not the ocean, not the fish, not the orcas. He goes after the family. That was his number one target then and his number one target now. You, your wife, your husband, your children, your grandchildren. Satan is trying to destroy covenant relationship with God. And he's trying to do it through the family. We were at lunch yesterday and someone was saying that they were on a plane. And they overheard someone sitting next to them saying that they were fasting. So he said, oh, you guys fasting. Huh? So he just asked, hey, I, I overheard you were fasting. What are you fasting for? He said he was in the church of Satan and he was fasting to destroy family. But see, this ain't no joke. This is real. We are in a war for our very souls. And how does the enemy destroy it? Who does he go after first? He goes after the family. And who in the family does he go after first? The woman. Why her? You ever wonder that? St. John Paul II says in Mulieris Dignitatem on the dignity of vocation of women that in God's eternal plan it is woman in whom the order of love in the created world of persons first takes root. What does that mean? In God's mind from all eternity when he planned to take love. Because 1 John 4, 16 says what? God is love. His very essence and nature and being, his usia in Greek, is his stuff, is love itself. He pours that love into man, male and female he created them. The Holy Father is saying that that love first took root, first established a home, first formed a foundation within the heart of the woman first. That a woman is the very heart of God's love. Every woman. Whether she's nine or 90. Whether she's married, has children, or she becomes a nun. By the very nature of her relationship with God, she is a life giver 
and a life bearer. And Satan knew that. So Satan says to himself, if I can destroy that, everything else will fall. And guess what? He was right. How does he do it? See, I think Satan is the one who developed the term recycling. Because he hasn't changed anything from what he did back in the day to what he's doing now. He hasn't changed anything. Let me give you an example. Now, we're near Pittsburgh, so I'm assuming we got Steelers fans in here. Now imagine, okay, hold on now. <laughs> so imagine the Steelers show up to camp this summer, and they're handed a playbook. And they flip through the playbook, every page is blank, except for one page has one play. That's it. Entire playbook, one play. How many games would they win? None. Why? Because every time they touch the ball, the other team knows what they're going to do every time. There's no way they can win. My brother and sister in Christ, Satan only has one play in his playbook, and we keep losing. Year after year, century after century, millennium after millennium, we keep getting our butts kicked by one play. I'm going to show you how that play works right now. One play, two parts. Here's the first part of his play. Notice his first words to her is a question. Did God say, or in the NAB, New American Bible, did God really say that you are not to eat of any trees in the garden? Girl, did he say that to you? <laughs> now, why did Satan ask that question? Very simply this, to plant the seeds of confusion and doubt in her mind, not only about what God said, but who God is in her life. To plant the seeds of confusion and doubt, not only about what God said, but who God is in your life. See, because up until this point, they're consciences. And what is the conscience? The practical application of the natural moral law, do good and void evil. So the conscience wants to point toward God, toward what St. Thomas Aquinas called the sonum bonum, the greatest good, the beatific vision, life with God forever in heaven. And by asking that question, planting the seeds of confusion and doubt, that compass needle that points north, starts to swing away from God, swing away from the beatific vision, sw swing away from our ultimate end, and confusion and doubt, and ultimately points toward who? Yourself. How do we know the question worked? Look at her answer. God said we may eat of any tree, we may eat of freely eat of the trees of the garden, but God said we are not to eat the, the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, what's the problem with that answer? God never said nothing about touching the tree. He said, don't eat the fruit of the tree. So she's already confused about what God said. But she got the last part right, lest we die. Woo, Satan hears that word death, die, it's a mavet in Hebrew. And it means not just physical death. It means to cut yourself off from God's life to cut yourself off from the life of God. So Satan hears that word and goes, die? You will not die. And why does Satan say that? Because he's a liar. He's a, he'll say whatever he's got to say and do whatever he's got to do to kill the life of God in you. And how does he do it in the beginning? By making them think that they're God. Think about it. Satan says, well, you, don't, you won't die because, see, God is jealous. God wants to keep all the power to himself. And he knows that when you eat of the tree, you will be like God. But you don't need God because you're your own God. Think about what that sounds like in the church today. What, do I have to go to church every Sunday? I can worship God any way that I want. Who says some white guy from Argentina with a beanie on his head can tell me what to do with my body? <laughs> and where does this spirit of Satan leave us in the church today? We Catholics have been filled with the spirit of apathy and embarrassment about sharing our faith. We keep the faith to ourselves and contain within the walls of the church. We're Catholic in here on Sunday, but somebody else, Monday to Saturday. 
When we are challenged by our friends and loved ones about why we are Catholic, we cower. When the culture tries to shove subjective truth down our throats, we worry about being politically correct. When unborn children are slaughtered and marriages redefined, we remain silent or turn the other way. Our Lord Jesus Christ and his blessed mother gives us faith that allows us to give ourselves completely to the living God and make no excuses for why we are Catholic. The salvation of the world began through Mary and through her most and through her it must be accomplished. In the second coming of Jesus Christ, Mary must be known and openly revealed by the Holy Spirit so that Jesus may be known, loved, and served through her. Mary must become as terrible as an army in battle array to the devil and his followers, especially in these latter times. For Satan, knowing that he has little time and even less now more than ever, to destroy souls, intensifies his efforts and his onslaughts every day. He will not hesitate to stir up savage persecutions and set treacherous snares for Mary's faithful servants and children, whom he finds more difficult to overcome than others. Now, if you have a problem with this image of the Blessed Virgin Mary as a warrior, I ask you to go back to Genesis chapter 2, when it says that God, remember, it's not good for man to be alone. <clears throat> Why? Because we're made in the image and likeness of God, amen? And God exists as a family, as a communion of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the family on earth must be in the image of the family of heaven. So man by himself makes no sense. So God says, I'm going to create a helper fit for him. <laughs> now, helper does not mean maid, does not mean someone who cooks my food, picks up my clothes, does my laundry, drives my kids to soccer practice. The word in Hebrew, the word in Hebrew is actually a compound word. It's help mate, a zada konegdo. And whenever the Jewish people used those two words together, as that or connecto, it meant someone who stands opposite or parallel to you, who helps, aids, assists, surrounds, protects, and defends in battle. God created a battle partner for him. And what is the battle going to be against? Satan, sin, and death. What does a soldier in the army of Mary look like? St. Louis de Montfort says, we know they will be true disciples, disciples of Jesus Christ, imitating his poverty, his humility, and his contempt for the world. They will point out the narrow way to God in pure truth according to the Holy Gospel and not according to the thinking of the world. Their hearts will not be troubled. They will not fear any man, however powerful he may be. They will have the two-edged sword of the word of God in their mouths and the blood-stained standard of the cross on their shoulders. They will carry the crucifix in their right hand and their rosary in the left and the names of Jesus and Mary on their hearts. This is my rosary. Now, some of you are looking at this and saying, Deacon, I think those are bullets. They are. This rosary was designed by Master Sergeant Michael Catone, Army Special Forces, who was a lax, fallen away Catholic who had a massive conversion experience through the Blessed Virgin Mary when he served in Afghanistan. After his conversion through the heart of the Blessed Mother, he made, well, this is a replica of his rosary because his, our father beads were 50 caliber shells. I actually saw that rosary. He went like this, and that rosary hit the ground. <laughs> Why do I have this rosary? Because these bullets are 40 caliber and 9 millimeter shells 
pushed in together. Why? Because every time you pray the rosary, pow, pow, pow. You pull a bullet through Satan's heart. <clears throat> the beads on this rosary are made from ox bone, the bones of an ox. Why? Psalm 92, you have given me the wild ox's strength. You anointed me with the purest oil. My eyes looked in triumph on my foes. My ears heard gladly of their fall. It's a battle cry. The cord is made from industrial strength, commercial grade fishing line. Fishers of men. The knots, there's seven knots for the seven sacraments, ten knots for the ten commandments, and three knots all throughout the rest of the rosary for the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The cross is a Cursillo cross. Let me, so, let me tell you something. This is a man's, I mean, women can use it too, but it's a man's rosary. And I'll tell you something. It's a whole different experience meditating on the, the mysteries of Jesus Christ with a bullet in your hand. When you start praying the rosary, when you give your life over to the Blessed Mother through her immaculate heart, Satan will run from you. He will go find an easier target. Let me explain to you the power. Not, I only have time to do the short version. The power of the rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, I don't think it says it in my bio, but I was born on the island of Barbados in the West Indies. My father was pagan. My mother was a convert to the Catholic faith. She was Methodist and became Catholic. I am the oldest child of their union, and I am therefore the very first baptized Catholic in the history of our family. When we moved to the United States, when we moved to the United States, my father did not come with us. Why? My father is a famous Calypsonian. He sang soca music. It's kind of like the Caribbean version of disco, okay? Of like R&B. He's very popular. My father loved three things in his life. <laughs> Womenizing, alcohol, and cigarettes. My father had 17 other children besides the four of us with other women. Number 17 just made his presence known to us on Facebook three months ago. If you've ever grown up in a house with alcohol, I don't even have to tell you of the crazy, embarrassing moments that happen in a house like that. I don't know how my mother stayed married to him for as long as she did. I think she wanted to have at least some semblance of a family. My father, I never saw my father in church, ever. In fact, I asked my mom once, Mommy, when's the last time Pop was in church? She pulls out some photos of a wedding. That's the last time I ever saw your father in a church. The only time I ever heard him use God's name was in vain. But even after the divorce, which was an ugly, messy, nasty divorce, and after that was over, I still maintained a decent relationship with my dad until I joined the Benedictines. When I was accepted into the monastery, out of courtesy and respect, I went to see my father, and I told him what I was doing. He said something, it went something like this, you're gonna do what? You are the first person in our family ever to go to college. You get an academic scholarship to Notre Dame. He used to tell all his friends, my son goes to Notre Dame. My son goes to Notre Dame. You get an economics and business degree. And now you're going to waste your life living with a bunch of men? What's wrong with you? What am I supposed to tell my friends? I told him what he could tell his friends. <laughs> and then we didn't speak for 18 years. As far as I was concerned, my father was dead. In fact, when my children asked, 
where's our grandfather? Because my wife's father died when she was 18. I never even met him. He died of cancer way, way before we even met. So when my kids asked where they're going, where am I? I said, he's dead. I hated my father. Now, some of you may be saying, well, Deacon, that's a strong word. Yeah, it is. And I meant, and I meant it. I hated him. I wouldn't have cared if I never would have seen him again for the rest of my life. Now, fast forward. I leave the monastery because my mother has a heart attack, almost dies. I have to leave to take care of my family. Now, I'm the oldest. I had to take care of my sister who was still in high school, make sure she ate and got to school, take care of my mother while she convalesced. And then I went to a wedding of some ND friends of mine. And at this wedding, I met this woman from the enchanted land of Oregon. <laughs> well, needless to say, I did not go back to the monastery. And I moved from New Jersey to Oregon and you know the rest. Now, when I was leaving to move out west, I had a conversation with my mother. My mother was like 4'8", okay, short. We have a, we're a short family. My mother said, son, before you leave, I just want to ask you to do one thing. I said, mommy, anything. She said, I want you to pray for your father. It was one of the only times in my life I re ever remember looking my mother in the face and saying no. She just looked at me. I don't think you heard what I said, son. <laughs> the only thing I want you to do is to pray for your father. <sighs> okay, mommy, I'll pray for pops, whatever. And so I would tag my father in at the end of my prayers. Didn't mean it. <laughs> I'm, being, I'm being honest with you. I didn't mean it. I just did it because I told my mother I would. So the years go by now. But you know what? My heart softened a little bit. So I would send announcements for our wedding. No response. Birth announcements for each of the kids. No response. Birthday. No response. Christmas. No response. And I said, that's okay, because if I die and I stand before Jesus and we start going through the commandments, by the time we get to number four, hey, I tried. So now, my first series starts to air on EWTN in 2005, Behold the Man. This was now 17 years. Now remember, I said I talked to my father in 18 years. This is year 17. My series starts to air. Now, it starts to air internationally. My relatives in Barbados call my father and say, isn't that your son on TV? My son? So he turns the channel. And there I am. So he starts watching. Now the next week, he wants to watch me again. Now I don't know any of this is going on. He starts, but he gets the time wrong. So he flips to EWT and I'm not on. But there's some old nun. <laughs> Sitting in that chair with the Bible. And she laughs like, <laughs> <laughs> and my father's like, what is this? <laughs> but she starts speaking, and my father got sucked in. Now, this goes on for a year. Now, at this time, I'm still working in my secular job. I was the police chief at the university. I was in law enforcement for a long time. That's another story. Like I said, this is the short version. So I'm driving home from work and my cell phone rings. I, I, I look, it's a New Jersey prefix. I think it's my brother. Hello, son? Huh? I, I almost crashed the car. I had to pull over to the side of the road. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm in complete shock. What is this? And he starts speaking. When I hung up the phone, it said 31 12. 31 minutes and 12 seconds. 
And he spent most of that time talking to me about Jesus. No, wait, 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 wait. Don't get happy because I wasn't. <laughs> After I got off the phone with him, I was livid. I literally sat in the car screaming to myself, who the hell does he think he is to call me up after 18 years to tell me about Jesus? I'm the one who's on EWTN. I'm the one. <laughs> Hold on now. Hold on. Brothers and sisters, it only gets better from here. Trust me. I'm the one on EW10. I'm the one traveling to Singapore and Malaysia, South Africa and Japan and all these places talking about Jesus. He doesn't know Jesus. All that man did was destroy our family. I know Jesus. I said, Lord, I don't believe anything that comes out of that man's mouth. Because all he did to us my entire life was lie. If this is from you, you're going to have to show me. And I learned that night, you got to be careful what you ask for. <laughs> Up to that point, I had not received an invitation to speak in my home state of New Jersey. Ten days later, I get an invitation to speak at a parish 3.1 miles away from where my father lives. So now I go to do the thing, and, I, and, I'm, and when I go back home, I stay with my brother. And so my brother arranged for me to see my dad. And this whole time, I'm, I'm more, my spiritual director, you know, what is this going to be like? You know, so my father walks in, and the first thing I noticed, and I actually was shocked by his appearance, he had had prostate cancer. He had lost half of his body weight. He was a big guy like me. And now he walked in, I was like, what the? I almost didn't recognize his, his hair. He had big patches of hair missing because of the chemo. And I was like, what? He goes, hi, son. And, hi. and I, I was just, I was completely shocked by his appearance. And he said, it's good to see you, son. I said, yeah, Pop. And we, it was very awkward. And, and I waited to hear, I'm sorry son, for the hell that I put you and your mother and your siblings through. I'm sorry for all those embarrassing, shameful moments with the alcohol. I'm sorry for stepping out that you had to be the man in charge at 12 years old while I was out sleeping around with us. I'm waiting to hear, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. All my father would talk about was what kind of man he is now. And the Lord showed me a huge lesson that night. The Lord said to me in my heart, look, you know what happened back then, and he knows what happened back then. There's nothing either one of you can do to change it. So deal with the person I have in front of you. You know, my record had been stuck. It was skipping. It, well, to some, some, some of you may not even be old enough to remember what a record is. I, we, have, we have a set of twins, and I remember the twins were about seven years old, and they saw a record for the first time. They said, Daddy, what's this? I said, this is a record. We used to play music in this. They said, they're like, hold on. How did this fit in the car? They thought it was a disc you put in the car. Yeah. <laughs> so like I said, my father was a singer. So he goes, I'm, I'm still writing music, son. Do you want to hear my latest song? Whatever, Pop, go ahead. So he puts on the song, and it's a music track, and he starts to sing. Here are some of the lyrics. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. My eyes are wide open, yet I failed to see. Lord Jesus, I beg you, have mercy. I'm so sorry. Lord, forgive me. I love you. I want to live a life that's honest and true. Lord, show me the way. I can't go on living without you. 
Lord Jesus, I beg you, have mercy. So as he's singing this song, I'm saying to myself, there is no way you can fake this. And when he finished singing, I don't know what possessed me to do this, but I literally walked up to my father. I'm standing literally toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, looking him in the face. I'm only 5'6", he's 5'10". He's not that much taller than me. Remember, we're a short family. I looked that man in the face, and I said, I'm going to ask you a question right now. If you've ever loved me even once as your son, don't lie to me. If you're going to lie, then say nothing. What happened to you? All this Jesus and mercy. Had I not been standing in that man's face to hear what came out of his mouth next, I would never have believed it. This unbaptized pagan who never set foot in a church as far as I know, who destroyed our family, in all seriousness, looked me in the face and said, the blessed mother and divine mercy. I was stunned. I literally could not speak. My brother to this day still mocks me. He said, man, because I, I did a parish mission in Jersey, my, my dad and my brother came. And he, my brother said, I still remember, man, when Pop told you that Blessed Virgin Mary stuff and that Divine Mary, the look on your face, I literally could not speak. I could not form words in my mouth. Now, I go back home to Oregon. Now, by this time, my mother is living with us. She lived the last three years of her life in Oregon with our family. She said, is it true, son? I said, Mommy, you can't fake what I saw. A few months later, my father, now we're speaking at least once a month. My father calls me up. Son, I'm coming to Oregon. I want to see my grandchildren. Remember, my, fa my father's never met my wife or my children. And I said, okay, Pop, when do you want to come? He told me the weekend. That's a bad weekend for me, Pop. I got stuff on me. He goes, that's the only weekend I can come, so I'm coming. And I said, okay. So now I have to go back and tell my family, but we got a problem. I told the kids he was dead. So I did what any intelligent husband would do. I went to my wife and said, how do I get out of this? <laughs> and my wife nonchalantly says, well, Jesus did raise the dead, didn't he? <laughs> so. The kids were still fairly young. My oldest was only 10. And so I said, God, kids gather around. Guess what? A miracle! <laughs> so fast forward. My father flies out to Oregon, meets my wife and my kids. Now, there are a number of things that happened that weekend that were miraculous. I'm only going to share, because of the time, I'm only going to share a couple things with you that happened that weekend. Now, he came on a Thursday. Some cool things happened Thursday, Friday. Saturday is a men's conference in Portland. I'm not speaking, but I always go to support the guys because I need fellowship too. Just because I'm Deacon Harold don't mean I don't need no fellowship. I'm with my brothers too. So I said, Pop, I'm going to this men's conference. Do you want to come? He said, sure. He's never been to anything Catholic before in his life. So he comes to the conference. And he sees the men, the praise and worship, and the men are there raising holy hands. And my father said, I didn't know Catholics could do it like this. He said, hey, look at that. <laughs> One of the speakers was Father Donald Calloway. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I ain't got to tell you what happened next. So I'm sitting with my dad. Across, we have these round tables. I'm sitting across from my dad. Father Calloway starts telling his story. You know, he gets to the part about when he was kicked out of Japan at 15 years old because by then he was doing prostitution, 
He was doing drug running. He was doing money laundering. He was running with Japanese gangs. 15, he was put on a plane by Japanese military police and told never to come back to this country again. My father leans over across the table. That guy's a priest? <laughs> yeah, Pop. So father keeps talking about it. He goes, he leans over to my father. He's worse than me. So now Father Calloway gets to the part of his story that changed everything for him. What changed everything? An encounter with Mary. So now my father literally grabs my arm and starts shaking. Mary, son, son, give Mary. It's like, I said, I know, Pop. That's, 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 it's Mary. So I said, Pop, I know, Pop. I'm saying. And so after, I got, I got to meet this guy. I got to meet this guy. So I know Father Calloway. So I, it's now Father Calloway is supposed to be signing books. Instead, He's off talking to my dad. Those two are going back and forth, back and forth about Mary. And I'm standing there going, look at this. You know? I said, I I'll sign for you, Father. Don't worry, you know? <laughs> we leave the men's conference, and we're driving back home. My father wants to take the family out to dinner. It's a Saturday night. Now, my mom was living with us, but during this time, she was in a convalescent home because she had a bout of congestive heart failure and she needed more care than we could give her at home. So I said, Pop, let me drop you home. Let me go see mommy and then we can go out to dinner. He said, no, let's go see your mother. Now, I had not seen my father in 18 years or spoken to him. My, my mother had not seen or spoken to him for over 20 years. So we're actually driving by the place which was only a mile from our house. And I don't have time to warn my mother. So we pull into the driveway. We get out. We go to, I said, Pop, let me go in first. So I go in. My mom's laying in the bed. I come around to the side of the bed. I sit down. I lean over. I kiss my mom. And she goes, son. I said, Mommy. <laughs> in walks my father. The, I will never forget the look on my mother's face when my dad walked in. I, it was like, shock, her eyes, boom, big. It was like shock, anger, joy, all wrapped up into one. I get up off the bed. My father comes around to the side of the bed. He sits down. He reaches out and grasps my, my mother's hands. Now, my mother's name was Eleanor. And he says, hello, Eleanor. And they start talking. And I leave the room. So I close the door and I'm standing outside five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes. I ask the nurse for a chair. <laughs> twenty minutes. Now, after twenty minutes, I'm thinking, what's going on? Because this is the, the first conversation that I remember them having where there wasn't yelling or something being thrown. Half an hour later, my father comes out. Okay, son, let's go. Uh, okay, Pop. So I go in and kiss my mom goodbye. She said, uh, who was that? <laughs> I said, I know, Mommy. I, I'm getting used to this, too. <laughs> now, my mother never told me, my mother died, by the way, four months to the day, to the hour that my father last saw her. My mother never told me what they talked about. Ain't my business, as between a husband and wife, ain't my business. But she said this to me after my father left. She said, son, remember when you were leaving to go to Oregon, what I asked you to do? Oh, yeah. I told you no. She said, starting on that day, I started praying a rosary a day for your father. And I said, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold, stop. Mommy, wait a minute. What do you mean? You, pray, you prayed a rosary every day? Mommy, what happened after year 10? What happened after year 15? You kept praying rosaries for Pop? 
every day? What happened after year 17? How come you didn't stop? She believed with all, she only asked God for one thing before she died. Only one thing. That her and my father would be reconciled. And that's exactly what happened in that room that night in the hospital. The power of the rosary. The power of the rosary. Now, I wish the story could end there. But just one more little caveat. The next day, my father went to Mass. First time I ever saw my father in church. It was Sunday, Father's Day. And I preached in my parish on Father's Day. So I gave the Father's Day homily with my, the first time I ever saw my father in my life in the church, sitting in the front row where my mother used to sit. Now, one more quick thing. It says time's up. But the Holy Spirit said, keep talking. I know my time is up, but I heard yesterday they said, don't contain the Holy Spirit. <laughs> One more quick thing. Hold on to your seats. Two th this was, when this, all this happened, by the way, this was 2006. Okay? Now, 2012... I'm on a year of faith tour. I had the privilege of speaking in Australia, Ireland, and Italy. In October of 2012, I'm in the middle of my tour in Italy. My brother calls me, hey, man, you need to come home. You need to come through Jersey on your way back. I said, what are you talking about? Pop's cancer is back. They found a mass in his cecum. The cecum is what connects the small and the large intestine. They can't operate because he can't pass the heart test for the surgery. He'll die in surgery. They're just going to hit it with some chemo, but they're telling me he won't make it till Christmas. You need to come home. So at great expense, but I didn't mind, I changed my ticket to come home through Jersey. I spent three days with my dad. I want to tell you about the power of the Blessed Virgin Mary and forgiveness. Two things happened during those three days. One of the things that I did was I asked my father to forgive me for hating him for 18 years. Now, in the thinking of the world, I was justified. All the stuff, I could name all the stuff that, but I still remember what happened. But you know what? My past does not dictate my present or my future. My past... My past shaped me into the person I am today, but it doesn't determine how I act from this day forward. I, asked, I knelt down in front of my father and asked him to forgive me for hating him for 18 years. And he forgave me. The next day I was leaving to go back to, to, go back to Oregon. My brother was throwing my stuff in the car. My father was sitting on the edge of the bed with his head in his hands. And I said, Pop, it's going to be okay. And he just nodded his head. I said, would you like to pray, Pop? So I knelt down, first time I ever prayed with my father. We said a prayer. And then I, after the prayer, I said, Pop, I love you. Only time I ever remember my life ever telling my father I loved him. My father looked at me and said, I love you too, son. Tears in his eyes. I always have and I always will. Then I left. I thought, this is it. I'm never going to see my father again. I go back home to Immaculate Heart Catholic Church, my parish, where I'm assigned. And I say to the pastor, I tell my, you know, because my father's like a hero at Immaculate Heart. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know he, he, that's where, you know, he was in church. That's the first place he ever went to church as a Catholic. I mean, in the Catholic Church. And so I tell Father Nicholas, he goes, oh, I tell him about the tomb. Don't worry, Mary will take care of it. I said, okay, Father, whatever, you know, I. So he basically ordered everyone in the parish to start praying rosaries for my father. So the months go by. December 12th. 
I get a call from my brother. Hey, man, I'm at the hospital with Pop. And I'm thinking, okay, here we go. I got to start planning to buy a ticket for a funeral. I'm preparing myself. He's gone. My brother says, hey, man, Hari. Hari, that's my, don't start, that's my pet name that they call me. Don't worry about that one. <laughs> he says, uh, Hari, the tumor is gone. I said, hold on. No, hold on. Here's my, I said, oh, yes. I mean, it shifted into the intestine. He goes, no, man, I'm standing here looking at the x-ray. It's not there. I said, holy cow. So I go back and I call Father, because I'm, pre- I'm doing a mass that evening. So I go to Father Nichols. Father Nichols, my brother just called. He said, the tumor is gone. He said, nonchalant. Well, I told you Mary would take care of it. <laughs> Come on now. My father turned 81 years old a few months ago, still alive and kicking. The man is on fire for Jesus Christ now. You know, when I talk about my dad, I feel like the guy in the vineyard. You know, I came in at 8 o'clock in the morning. (laughs) My father came in at 545. But my brothers and sisters in Christ, as I end my time with you today, no matter how dark it gets, the light of the new Pentecost, kindled by the children of Mary, will grow ever brighter to set this world ablaze with the fire of the Holy Spirit. The light of Christ. Amen. It is that same Holy Spirit that will move us from sorrow to joy, from despair to hope, and from death to everlasting life. Amen. God bless you guys.